About seven years ago, I came across one of the most fascinating adaptogenic substances available. This ingredient is three times more energetically dense than gasoline. It's the smallest known molecule in the universe, where many of the classic adaptogens or drugs target one particular organ. This substance targets just about every organ throughout the body. It improves what's called the redox status of the cell, which is basically how the body converts one chemical into another. It's the superior antioxidant because it works selectively. When you have insufficient oxidation, you can have more misfolded proteins, which accelerates the aging process. Conversely, too much oxidative stress underlies just about every disease. This substance also mimics one of the fasting pathways. An animal study showed that water filled with this substance had the same effect as 20% caloric restriction. It also induces longevity benefiting heat shock proteins and works at both the gene and epigenetic level to influence all kinds of different signaling pathways for up to 24 hours after it's gone. I call it the molecule of bioharmony. This molecule is also called molecular hydrogen. And in today's episode, we are discussing the ancestral basis for it, the role of fiber in the human diet and how that relates to hydrogen, the right dosing protocols, the safety and potential side effects, hint, there aren't many, and everything else you might want to know about this substance. And our guest this week is one of what I view as the two leading voices in the industry. Our guest is Alex Tarnava. He's the inventor of the patented and clinically validated open cup hydrogen tablets, which have significantly impacted the health and wellness industry. In addition to his work on growing the commercial market, Alex actively contributes to expanding the ever-increasing knowledge and research on molecular hydrogen. You can find links to everything we discuss and a whole lot more in the show notes for this episode, which will be at mindbodypeak.com slash the number 147. If you want to try the Drink HRW molecular hydrogen tablets for yourself, you can use the code URBAN and that'll save you 10% on your order. Unfortunately, I didn't get around to asking Alex his take on Brown's Gas and specifically the AquaCure AC50 model that I have, but he does mention that he's a fan of certain high quality machines, although very few on the market actually produce the hydrogen output they claim. All right, ladies and gentlemen, sit back, relax, and enjoy this podcast episode. Alex, welcome to Mind Body Peak Performance. It's great to have you. Today we'll be discussing your forte and one of my favorite subjects, and that is all things molecular hydrogen. But before we dive in, Let's warm up today with the unusual non-negotiables you've done for your health, your performance, and your bioharmony. Well, for my health, because I know uh, I have a hard time getting to sleep, especially I do business and research in Europe and Asia. Um, and I'm often up working till like one in the morning or later. So I refuse to schedule calls before 10 a.m., right? Just because sleep is one of the most critical things there is i also push myself to go walk through nature at least five times a week right whether i'm up to it or not um i both love doing it and walking is so good for your your health yeah simple high impact things to do okay well give me a little bit about your backstory i came across your work many years ago and was I started immersing myself in the whole world of molecular hydrogen. How did you get into all this? So it's a, a long story. Um, I guess it's going back uh, close to 10 years now, about 10 years. Um, I went through a health crisis in my late 20s. Um, I had some sort of a mystery virus is the best the doctors could figure out. It uh, led to me having, you know, central nervous system fatigue. I couldn't jump an inch off the ground. Um, I had uh, sudden onset narcolepsy. I was sleeping 16 plus hours a day. My, my inflammatory markers were through the roof. They were like 100 times abnormal. My C-reactive 
proteins were like, you know, 35 milligrams a deciliter or 34, I think they were. And this was at a period where I was the most healthy and fit I'd ever been in my life. So I was training four to six hours a day between CrossFit and martial arts at this time um, in phenomenal shape. So this just absolutely ravaged me. And after the couple months that whatever was going on was going on, and then the dust cleared, it left me with osteoarthritis in 11 different joints. That was basically a death sentence to training the way I ever had. And uh, the GP, the, the doctor I was working with at the time, um, he put me on 1,000 milligrams of naproxen a day. So that's a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drug. I think Aleve, right, by brand name. But when you get Aleve over the counter, you might do like 200 milligrams. I was taking 1,000 milligrams at the time to try and suppress the inflammation and getting cortisone injections as well into the worst joints. Um, I knew this wasn't a long-term solution right? You know, especially I was like 29 at the time, or maybe I just turned 30. So I just started scouring, you know, PubMed for any therapies that I could find that would regulate the inflammatory response. Um, I found a, a number of different things, but uh, hydrogen was one of them. I found a, a machine to make hydrogen water and paid like $5,000 for it and just went about my merry way you know, was back to exercising, not like I was before, but, you know, training five times a week, an hour or two a day type thing. And maybe nine months later, I forget the exact timeline, I fainted a couple times in the gym. So it, it turns out that the naproxen had led to, you know, multiple ulcers and I wasn't processing nutrients properly, um, getting proper nutrition. <laughs> Um, so I had to abruptly stop the naproxen and within like a couple days, all my joints froze, like completely froze. Like couldn't put on like socks, couldn't put on a, a shirt properly. Um, I was just absolutely screwed. So that took me back to the drawing board and I realized that none of the other therapies I'd found and that I'd spent all this money on, including the hydrogen water machine were doing anything. None of them were working and helping with my inflammation. Um, so I went back to PubMed and uh, I found some more studies on hydrogen therapy and hydrogen water, which kind of annoyed me because I had this $5,000 machine and it wasn't helping. But then it just dawned on me, how do I know that this machine is producing hydrogen? I just took the salesman's word for it. And how do I know how much it's producing? So I started buying the, the entire studies so that I could read the full material and methods and realized that none of the research papers uh, were using a machine like the one I'd bought. They were typically creating the hydrogen water in their lab through various methods and getting, you know, like at that time, pretty high concentrations. So I found a, a you know, chemistry kit, like a titration reagent to test the water from the machine. And on first attempt, it was undetectable. So it said there was no hydrogen. But when I tripled the input, right, I got one drop reduced. So it was like 0 0.03 parts per million of hydrogen, which was like a fraction like of what the other studies were doing. So that actually gave me a little bit of hope. Um, I thought to myself, well, I actually haven't tried hydrogen yet, you know, and the research is piling up. Um, how can I do this myself? And uh, that's when I started playing kind of like, you know, mad engineer, mad chemist in my kitchen, um, finding the raw materials that were not easy to source or get into the country uh, to, to make my very first tablets. And uh, I, I started hand pressing these first tablets and within like a week, my joints started loosening up, right? I started feeling better, right? Like didn't reverse my, my damage or anything like that, but I could go back to my daily life. And that got me excited, but I had to, a little bit of a, a, you know, sober second thought thinking, you know, I'm using magnesium metal here, which burns at 
thousands of degrees. It's the white in fireworks, right? Um, very volatile and reactive to make hydrogen gas, which of course is also explosive, right? And I'm doing this in my kitchen, right? You know, not to mention, you know, I, I'm, uh, I sent off like the magnesium and at that time I was not getting it from reputable sources and the heavy metals were a little bit higher than I wanted them to be. And so I'm like thinking like, man, like how can I make this safe for myself? And am I doing something wrong? Right. I, I don't want to win a Darwin award here and kill myself trying to heal myself. Right. Whether it's exploding my kitchen while I'm in it or heavy metal poisoning. And, um, I found my founding partner. He, he's a PhD, you know, in, in uh, organic chemistry. He works in the pharmaceutical industry and drug development. So he designs molecules that they research to be drug candidates. At first, he told me it was the worst pseudoscience he'd ever heard in his life, and he gave me this long list of reasons why it was really stupid, and you know, um, you couldn't dissolve hydrogen in water in enough of a dose, and even if you could, it's inert in the body, and uh, because I'd been reading so many papers, I was able to rebut everything he said with citations and, you know, peer reviewed research. And he got back to me and he said, ah, she, he's blown away, uh, very surprised, but he said, okay, I'll, I'll take a look at what you have, like still skeptical. Um, and I kept on sending him a new paper every day as he was working on my formulation and what I'd been doing and reviewing everything. And, uh, just serendipitously, um, I sent him a, a paper on a, a certain model um, that had had some effects in humans you know, in a decent sized, uh, you know, randomized controlled trial. Um, and he, he called me and asked if I wanted to meet for lunch. And he basically said, uh, listen, um, the other papers, I'm not a mat subject matter expert on. I just have to take the, the conclusions. But on this design, this is my current main project where I'm working on small molecules to try and treat this condition. And unless this paper is fraudulent, this stuff works, right? Um, are you sure you just want to do this as a do it yourself project or do you want to pursue this commercially? Right? So I thought long and hard about it because I, I really, really detest the supplement industry right? For a lot of reasons. Um, I really didn't want to make it my career, but I was really interested in, in hydrogen and what I was doing with it. And I had seen the results and I decided to go for it um, with the caveat that I had to pursue this from an evidence-based standpoint, right? Um, that uh, I had to design how we were going to pursue research in a way that the truth would come out rather than manufacturing, you know, the truth that I want people to know, which is why we work with universities and they're not under any sort of contract or gag order. They publish the results regardless of what they find, whether it works or doesn't work. So I have no control, you know, over the final, you know, say on, on what sees the light of day. Yeah, I have to agree with you. That's one of the things that people might not know about the supplement industry is that you're the exception here. A lot of companies would not do that. And if negative results are found, they will never see the light of day. Not, not just supplement companies, pharmaceutical companies, um, anything, but uh, even when there isn't, you know, gag orders in place, a lot of researchers refuse to publish negative studies, like negative findings for reasons like getting their own grants and time and funding allocation. So they do this study, for instance, and it doesn't pan out, right? Uh, journals, which are a big business, right? Publishing is a massive business. They don't want to publish negative findings because people don't want to read it, right? So it's hard to publish negative findings. You have to go into a low tier journal. Now, if you go into a lower tier journal to publish negative findings, that looks bad on their publication record, you know, as the you know primary author, because why did they publish in this low impact journal? So that can actually hurt them in getting future grants. Plus, in getting grants, the biggest thing that they do is show that they found significant results. 
So not only is there no incentive for researchers to publish negative findings, they're disincentivized, they're punished for doing it. So to get from making them in mortar and pestle to making millions at a time high speed on a manufacturing line presented tremendous challenges. So from when we, we refined it in the mortar and pestle to when we got our first production ready tablet was about a year. It was 15 failed scale up attempts and it was a few thousand iterative adjustments that we had to make. Like, and, and I had to basically devote myself to this because this was brand new and it was confusing everyone. So uh, I had to, from the manufacturers to pharmaceutical formulation consultants, I, I hired so I basically had to read every patent I could find, every study I could find, every textbook I could find on on pharmaceutical formulation, um, particularly with, with lubrication and binding, right? Um, to basically figure out and put all the pieces together on how we could make a product that actually works and that you can make at a large scale. And you're smiling now throughout this story. So it sounds like from the initial symptoms and lifestyle you were living that things worked out. Hydrogen is not a miracle. It hasn't regrown my cartilage. I'm bone on bone. Like this is my left shoulder. Like it doesn't go above my head anymore. I still have arthritis and 11 joints. Other than my shoulder, the rest of my joints haven't really progressed that much. So that, that could be uh, anecdotal. My left shoulder was so far gone, even by the time I started, that uh, there was not much left that could be done, especially I have multiple labral tears in my left shoulder as well. So just doubles down on, on the grinding and deterioration. Talk to me about some of the, the research. Like, What got you interested in this when you were combing through PubMed looking for different molecules and therapies and things you could do to improve your health when other things weren't working? the same way the early stories um of hydrogen are, are proving to not be accurate in vivo that got me interested but what we know now i actually find more interesting you know funny enough what initially got me in was, was early reports that uh, hydrogen could selectively reduce hydroxyl radical while you know not interacting with other beneficial oxidative stressors and was also anti-inflammatory and uh, ha had certain anti-aging benefits, like removing cells and, um, you know, a a like preventing apoptosis. So hydrogen, the, the pleiotropic effects really interested me. And like, how is this molecule doing all of these things? And how do we not know about it? Um, what's kept me interested is the story that we've been figuring out over the last several years of research and, and how profound it is. You know, um, for instance, hydrogen is not a direct antioxidant, right? It's actually not an antioxidant at all. It can be in vitro when you force it. It can be a selective antioxidant in like a, a Petri dish when you force the reaction to happen. But it's not really going to happen in a living body, right? What, what does happen is actually more important and more profound is hydrogen regulates our endogenous production of our own antioxidants and our beneficial oxidative stressors. So it regulates something called redox homeostasis, which is the harmony between our, our antioxidants and our beneficial oxidative stressors. Most people think about, you know, antioxidants is good and oxidative stress is bad, but that's not necessarily true because going into reductive stress is just as harmful as going into excess oxidative stress. So having too much antioxidants and not enough oxidants is a bad thing. And this is why all the high dose, ultra high dose antioxidant therapy human trials ha have stopped because they failed, right? They either show no benefits or in many cases, worse outcomes, you know, like uh, interfering with, with uh, you know, therapies like cancer therapies and, and reducing you know, lifespan, increasing all cause mortality. So you don't want to just flood your body with too much antioxidants. And that's one of the cool things hydrogen does is that it basically adjusts the dial, right? To, to make sure that we're geared towards optimal redox homeostasis, the harmony between the antioxidants and the beneficial stressors. 
Um, and the same thing with, with inflammation, it, it, uh, it, it's not anti-inflammatory. And, and this is actually really important for things like, you know, exercise, right? And, and athletes. I mean, athletes don't want to take anti-inflammatories and antioxidants in conjunction with training because they'll blunt hypertrophy gains. Uh, how exercise works, you know, to improve our health, other than the muscle component, um, is by actually spiking inflammation and oxidative stress for a, sh for a short period. It's called hormesis, right? And these spikes lead to positive adaptations in our body, right? So it'll chronically lower inflammation and oxidative stress if, if uh, they're elevated. Well, hydrogen is actually shown in conjunction with, you know, strength training to acutely raise the stressors beyond exercise alone, but rebound them back to homeostasis faster. So it's as if you, you worked out harder, but recovered quicker, which is pretty cool, right? Um, and it's showing to have similar benefits with other, you know, stressors that, that we've administered, like uh, improving outcomes in, in like uh, fasting models and cold exposure and heat exposure, for instance. But uh, even going deeper down um, over the last couple of years and realizing why hydrogen is so important to our physiology and how we, we basically are not getting it anymore, that's further intensified my interest and um, helped guide the research discussions I have with professors worldwide. Um, basically, it's... As hydrogen therapy is becoming more and more popular, researchers from other fields are adding input that wasn't what was known in their field, but not known by the researchers doing hydrogen um, to put the story together. You know, for instance, uh, we we know that hydrogen um, has been with us since the very beginning, right, of, of evolution before mitochondria existed. So the first mitochondria came from something called eukaryotes, right? And, and those eukaryotes, uh, they actually expelled hydrogen gas as a waste product, right? And those eukaryotes formed, you know, from a symbiotic relationship between two organelle, one of them which consumed hydrogen as its fuel source. So hydrogen has been with our mitochondria since before mitochondria existed, which, which might explain why hydrogen seems to be you know, something called the mitohormetic effector, or, or basically it's like exercise for our mitochondria, which is like the power plant of our cells. And that's how it's correcting a lot of what's going on in the cells by improving the number and function of our mitochondria by making them strong. Um, then throughout evolution and throughout history, we know that at points, especially in early evolution, there are much higher levels of hydrogen in our atmosphere and in our water. For instance, the oldest water we've ever discovered, about 2 billion years old, estimated deep beneath the Canadian Shield, still has detectable levels of H2 gas, whereas the water courses on our planet do not. But perhaps more relevant and a lot more recent is up until modern times, humans would have consumed 100 to 150 grams of dietary fiber a day. That is how we actually produce hydrogen gas endogenously by fermenting non-nutritive carbohydrates like fibers. Well, today, the average person on a Western diet only consumes about 14, 15 grams of fiber a day, right? So, you know, one seventh and one tenth the amount. But this is actually deceiving, deceptive, because other, like, some people consume a lot of fiber, like 60 grams, 100 grams a day, especially people on like high plant-based diets. But the average person on like the standard American diet that's eating a lot of fast food, they might only get one or two grams of fiber a day. So they're completely devoid of, of any fiber and any production of hydrogen. And it, it gets even worse because this these lifestyle changes and these poor diets lead to gut dysbiosis and your, your microbiome changes. So we now know that upwards of 60 to 80% of people who are middle-aged and overweight and have, have compromised their lifestyle like this produce no hydrogen when they're given something like lactulose 
you know, like uh, to do a hydrogen breath test. They produce methane instead because they've lost the bacteria needed to make the H2. We also know that H2 levels decline with age. So the older we get, people produce less and less hydrogen and more and more methane. So not only are we getting way less of the, the fuel source that we produce hydrogen in fiber, but we're now lacking the bacteria to break down that fiber and create hydrogen. So there, there is a massive hydrogen deficiency. And hydrogen isn't a nutrient, so that's not going to kill us, but it plays a, a very important regulatory role within our cells. You know, as a gaseous, you know, um, signal like um, transductor. So basically, we're not we're not getting it anymore, and that's why putting it, say, in like the water, inhaling it at a high concentration, that's showing such profound benefits because it's something we're lacking. You know, it's something like that we've evolved to anticipate and, and plays this regulatory role, like exercise. So we know how profound exercise is for our health especially for people who don't train and then they even start like a moderate training routine. And that's what hydrogen is shown to do. There's a number of things you just said that I want to highlight. First is the role of hydrogen in the body and the fact that it doesn't work indiscriminately like most other antioxidants do. It's more of like along the same lines of fasting or exercise or even like deliberate cold exposure would and it works kind of like an adaptive stressor in that regard and then also it's not like just blunting the certain pathways because there's signaling effects that happen after certain things such as those adaptive stressors and if you just completely blunt them by using like high dose antioxidants then you're going to negate some of those benefits so hydrogen like it amplifies the body's processes. And when I wrote, recently wrote a post on amplifying the benefits of fasting. And I actually mentioned hydrogen as a potential thing to look into because I see it as having those potential event effects, but not actually just shutting down oxidative stress or inflammation, but helping the body regulate it more effectively. Yeah. I, I like to call hydrogen kind of like a, a master supervisor within the cell that, you know, you're going to see changes but depending on what's going wrong, the changes could be very different, right? So hydrogen's like a, a supervisor going in and looking at a production line and saying, okay, we're making shoes. And today the line that's making the soles is going too fast and the soles are piling up. So they take someone off that line and put some on, on making like the tongue of the shoe. So the whole process can speed up. But then the next day, the soles are going too slow and the tongues are going too fast. So it takes a different person and, and puts them on that other line. So that's kind of why hydrogen will regulate a lot of these processes in our body, but it doesn't do the same thing every time it drives towards homeostasis or harmony, just like a, a good supervisor would that's overseeing the entire process. Oh, this is going too slow. This is going too fast or within our body. This is too high. This is too low. And, that's why we can see different changes depending on the study group. Um, even for things uh, very, you know, uh, it, it's huge in say like the anti-aging biohacking community to talk about autophagy. Hydrogen usually activates autophagy, but not always. There's been some important models where hydrogen has inhibited autophagy when we absolutely don't want it. Like after heart failure, after drowning, right? You absolutely don't want autophagy here and hydrogen has blunted it put a stop to it. So it's funny. I didn't know, I haven't heard you mention or call it that, but I actually call H2 the molecule of bioharmony when I'm explaining it to other people, because it really does that. There's a book called bioregulatory medicine that I read. And it talks about how like the issue with a lot of things that we consume being that they just force one particular outcome, either you're activating autophagy or you're inhibiting it. Very few things can actually act in like a smart way and do exactly what's needed in a particular situation. It is uh, far more impactful on our physiology when, when a molecule is plays a regulatory role like this. And then there's also a clear evolutionary need here, given that humans were exposed to a lot of it 
at much higher doses than we are now. And one thing, whenever I hear carnivore, actually, I just got an email newsletter yesterday about the role that fiber doesn't need to play in the human diet. And the issue with that is if you go for prolonged periods without any fiber, you can alter, you will alter the composition of your microbiome and it would be a tragedy to completely lose the certain species that are capable of creating hydrogen, which I fear when people use any of these super low fiber diets for long periods of time. Yeah. You know, um, when you lose certain strains, what the research is showing here, you know, with, with different strains of bacteria, there, there's some that can come back within a few days, right, uh, of changing your diet. There's some that might take years. But there's certain strains of bacteria that we found in like hunter gatherer populations that still aren't industrialized in the world that are completely absent from everyone else. So there could be generational bacterial strains that we just completely lost. Okay, so you've mentioned a number of different facets of hydrogen. What about the clinical research? I, I don't think people realize how much there is out there on molecular hydrogen so far. Yeah, so uh, there's about 2,000 publications on hydrogen right now um, showing a benefit in uh, every organ in the mammalian body across about 180 different models. Uh, as for clinical research, there's about 160 you know, human studies on hydrogen therapy. Uh, most of them are on hydrogen dissolved in water. I think over 100 of them are on hydrogen dissolved in water, the rest being... Um, bathing in hydrogen water, inhaling hydrogen gas or hydrogen saline, you know, or some other methods too. Out of those, the strongest clinical research are on the hydrogen tablets that, you know, I invented and pat patented. They do get by a landslide the highest concentration and dose of H2 of any product in the world. Um, our gas chromatography results show about 12.4 parts per million or milligrams a liter and 500 milliliters of water. So that'd be a dose of 6.2 milligrams of hydrogen. Uh, for context, like I said, that $5,000 machine produced 0 0.03 parts per million. So that's about 380 times higher than the tablets in the same volume of water that you drink, with, which obviously plays a big role. If you're going to take one four hundredth of an Advil, you can't expect the same effects as taking a full Advil. Um, this is one of the things that drives me insane but all of the marketers in the industry and, and consumers not being aware that every company just says, oh, hydrogen water, hydrogen water, hydrogen water all, has all these benefits. Well, no, hydrogen water, water, the water is just a delivery method for hydrogen gas. How much hydrogen gas are you delivering to people, right? That, that is what we need to know. And of course, there's going to be differences in bioavailability between water and inhalation. For instance, dissolving it in water um, show, shows like at least a hundred times better bioavailability than inhaling. And they actually have different, you know, pharmacokinetics and dynamics. They penetrate different tissues in different ways, um, you know, and, and interact in the body in different ways, which is very, very interesting. Uh, but uh, you can't just say hydrogen water because one hydrogen water versus another could have a, a difference in dosage of 10 times, a hundred times, 500 times. Like it, it can play a massive difference because hydrogen, like every other molecule, works in a dose-dependent manner. And at this point in the published literature, there are many instances where we need a higher dosage of hydrogen to see an effect, or a higher dosage has shown greater effects, and there's no instance where a lower dose has been more effective, right? Or a higher dose has been harmful. So it's really important to know that the dosing and the concentration of the hydrogen water you're getting. Um, and to circle back to the research on the hydrogen tablets, we have over 20 human studies published showing benefits of the hydrogen tablets. And we have a, a, an expert panel report of four professors that reviewed all the research to the FTC standards on making structure function claims. So we have 21 structure function claims that we can make on health benefits of the hydrogen tablet, which is absolutely unheard of in the supplement space. And I know when I was doing my own research, must have been at least four years ago, into the different 
hydrogen tablets on the market, I was blown away by what I found and the dis- level of deception and the numbers advertised not matching what actually shows up in third party test results. And yeah, drink HRW was my choice back then and still is because you guys led the industry in terms of the potency and your ability and desire to educate the consumer and help us understand this, what could be very confusing world of hydrogen. Yeah. And I mean, four years ago too, it was more of the wild, wild west. There was a couple of copycat like tablet manufacturers that were making tablets that either gave super low concentrations of hydrogen or some that were coming from like China or manufacturers that didn't understand um, and would produce no hydrogen. A lot of the companies um, in the industry do not have anyone that understands science at all. They just are 100% marketers that watch trends and then try and jump on the trend and don't even do their due diligence to see if they're properly jumping on. Alex, when I think about hydrogen, I see it as like the more out of balance the person is, the more organs need extra support, say the stress levels are too high, the inflammation is too high, whatever it is, or too low even, that's the subgroup of people, of users, who's going to see the biggest effect. Or even if you're under a very heavy stress, whether it's physical, it's chemical, it's emotional, it's mental, like those are the times and the use cases and the, the groups that are going to see the most from using hydrogen. Uh, people that have the most going wrong are the ones that are going to see the biggest changes. Uh, and what, what's funny, and, and this this is more more subjective than an, an actual marker change, the people most in tune with their bodies, you know, like high level biohackers, professional athletes, they notice changes, even though they're smaller, better than the average person in decent health, right? People who are really unhealthy, you really notice a benefit. And high level athletes and biohackers notice the benefit because they notice these small incremental changes. And they're like, oh, wow, this is, I can feel this. You know, when you, have like 15 more seconds of high intensity exercise or something, or like, yep, like one or two more reps out, or, you know, they've, they've noticed those changes. But people who are like basically healthy and uh, don't really pay close attention to their body, um, you have to advise them on what to look for. Yes. So, what are those things that you would advise that people to look for after they use, or that you often hear people noticing a big difference in terms of? So the ones that we hear the most commonly and are backed up by the research, mental clarity, especially when you're feeling run down and tired, you know, 10, 15 minutes after you take the hydrogen water, it's not a stimulant like effect like caffeine. Um, you're just going to feel normal, right? So if you have brain fog, you're tired, uh, having a hard time thinking and keeping on task, you take hydrogen, then all of a sudden you're just like, I feel okay. Right. So you don't feel jittery and high energy. You just feel okay. Right. And it lasts a few hours. Um, we get a lot of, of uh, testimonials regarding improved sleep and dreaming specifically. Um, a lot of people will comment, you know, especially like, you know, older people, especially older guys that work something in like physical labor will comment that they started dreaming again and that they haven't had a dream in 20 years but they've been dreaming every night, you know, after they start hydrogen. So we hear that a lot. Um, and we hear a lot about like just reduced like little aches and pains. What are some of the things you hear that perhaps are not substantiated by research, but like, in, like anecdotes that seem to come up? The dream one, like we just have a rodent study coming out. It's in press right now. So it's approved for peer review. And it found after any type of stress administered, it, it improves REM and non-REM sleep. So that could point to the dream, but there's no human evidence on this. I, I have been fortunate that I've made so many contacts with so many professors and research teams around the world that I've been able to persuade them to start research projects on a lot of these things that we're getting. So for instance, uh, there was no evidence until I convinced some teams to look into it on the increasing like alertness and attention and clarity of mind. Now we have four different clinical trials showing that we improve brain metabolism in different populations and, you know, showing that uh, 
we're, we're equivalent to raising, you know, attention as caffeine, right, after acute sleep deprivation. So the main ones, mental clarity, perhaps some form of sleep recovery or delayed onset muscle soreness, uh, attention, similar to caffeine, anything else that comes up? So the, the biggest one that we see in the research, um, and, and again, this is not something someone's going to report as a testimonial, but this is most consistent, um, is metabolic benefits, right? We've shown weight loss in four different trials, uh, improved body composition. Um, we've shown improved like, you know, cholesterol and, and triglycerides and blood sugars and, and like pre-diabetic like metabolic syndrome studies across like several trials. Um, this is where hydrogen has some of the strongest evidence in, but these incremental changes aren't something that someone's going to go, oh, wow, to, right? Like most people aren't testing their blood every month and seeing like these changes, right? So there are things that are very significant, but even like with the weight loss, it seems that hydrogen can help promote in these overweight populations about a pound of weight loss a month you know, uh, at least in the early, in the first several months, up to about six months. So that's very significant. But if someone's 300 pounds and then all of a sudden they're 294 pounds, or even if they're 220 pounds and they're 214, they might not go like, wow, this is a miracle for weight loss, even though it's having a very real impact. And that's not going to be weight loss that's derived coming from muscle tissue. That's going to be body fat. Yeah, body fat. Uh, this is actually one of the cool things. Um, we've shown significant reductions in, in body fat in a number of trials. Uh, you know, and uh, in one trial though that we didn't see weight loss in was our study on the elderly, and they actually increased muscle mass. So their body mass stayed the same, but they increased muscle mass. So that that was actually really really uh, interesting findings. Um, you know some things that went along with that in this study on the elder, uh, elderly, uh, we doubled the TET2, which is a protein linked to young blood. And so when you put the young blood from like a young mouse into an aged mouse, it actually revi revitalizes their skeletal tissue. So that could have been the leading reason why it increased muscle mass in this elderly population. However, in addition, it, it showed functionality because, uh, in that group and the average age was like 77 so it was a 70 plus population and six months uh, the hydrogen group improved their senior fitness test results so they could like sit and stand more times before getting tired than the placebo group or before the study started both of those are very significant the fact that even if scale weight stays the same which is why it's not a very good marker that if you're losing body fat and gaining muscle mass that's going to benefit you across the board in so many different ways. And then also the direct longevity improvements as measured through the senior fitness test of like standing and sitting and a lot of other different things like that. That is also very significant as you're getting older and it's indicating that a lot of things are working better. You mentioned cholesterol, different like lipoprotein panels and certain other things improving as measured by a blood test from using hydrogen. What other biomarkers, whether it's things you'd see in the blood or it's HRV or resting heart rate or even like brain waves as measured by EKG, EEG? Yeah, sure. There, there's been a, a lot of uh, changes in like heart rate in a handful of studies. We've seen that. Um, you know, we, we've seen improvements in, you know, inflammatory markers and oxidative stress markers. We improved nitrites. In a metabolic syndrome study, uh, we showed a reduction in liver fat, right, in, in a NAFLD study, non alcoholic fatty liver disease. And we uh, improved insulin sensitivity by 11% in, in that study group and dropped uh, AST as well by about 10%, I believe. Um, we've shown uh, improvements in, in uh, CoQ10, right, in the NAFLD study as well. Um, in the overweight study, uh, so these were, you know, 18 to 60 recruitments, um, just people who were overweight, not obese, but otherwise healthy. They had weight loss, improvements in some metabolic functions, but uh, they had some import important changes uh, in the stomach and in the brain, right? So in the stomach, it, it has some improvements on some of the short chain fatty acids like butyric acids, so butyrate and, you know, propionic acids, so propanate. Um, and uh, it also reduced calprotectin, 
which is a marker of like stomach inflammation, stomach damage. Um, and it uh, basically regulated ghrelin, which is huge, right? So they call ghrelin the hunger hormone, but it plays a lot of other roles. Like ghrelin has some neuroprotective roles. It uh, regulates glucose, you know, homeostasis. It regulates insulin production. So ghrelin is a very important molecule. And uh, what we want is spikes and drops in our ghrelin line. Because healthy people will have ghrelin go high when they're hungry and drop down to nothing when they're full. Obese people just have the steady state of ghrelin. So they're always a little hungry. And that's why they just keep snacking and eating more. Like they're not really hungry like people who aren't obese. They're like a little hungry all the time. So it's that constant hunger pang that keeps them eating more even beyond when they should be. Um, so it showed to regulate ghrelin and actually spike the ghrelin up higher in a fasting test, which was really cool. Um, in that study as well, we saw changes in, in uh, brain metabolism. In these overweight people, it, it regulated uh, the brain chemistry involved in satiety. In the elderly study, we, we saw um, like a 14% increase in telomere length in the hydrogen group and in DNA methylation. So it sounds like there are some pretty significant longevity benefits, more than I, re I realized initially, between the telomeres, the hormone like optimization, and like the body recomposition. It seems like this could be a really good addition to a longevity supplement stack. Yeah, yeah, and actually, there, there's some cool research in the, in mice um, where, where it didn't matter whether they gave hydrogen starting at a young age or like middle middle age type thing for mice. Um, hydrogen didn't increase maximum lifespan in the mice, but it dramatically improved average lifespan in, in the mice as compared to the control. So the control mice were like, you know, basically like all over the map, you know, from dying young to dying old, um, like anywhere from like 60 to 100 if you convert it to human year type idea. Whereas all of the hydrogen water treated mice were right at the top of the maximum longevity. So it was like they all lived to 100. Let's talk a little bit about usage. How do you best use it? There's been some controversy that I've seen over the years about the ideal protocols, how much to use, how many tablets, whether you should take it all at once or pulse it throughout the day, and then also what you can stack alongside it that would have potential synergistic benefits. This is a complex answer, right? Because we don't have perfect dosing protocols yet. Um, what we do know is that you want intermittent dosing rather than continuous dosing. So you definitely do not want to sit on hydrogen water all day long. Um, when we will give a continuous dose of hydrogen to say rodents, we see no benefits. But when we give intermittent spikes, we see benefits. You can think of this the same as you would with other forms of hormesis. You don't want to exercise all day long. You want that stress and then the recovery. If you exercise all day long, it's just chronic stress, right? We know with, say, cold exposure that if you have, say, pigs cold for four hours a day, then not cold the other 20 hours a day, that it lowers their inflammation, lowers their oxidative stress. It, it actually creates weight loss benefits. You know, it, it drives more white adipose mm -hmm. tissue to be beige or brown adipose tissue. But if all of a sudden you you have the things cold for like 16 hours a day or 24 hours a day, the opposite happens. Their inflammation goes up. Their oxidative stress goes up. They put on more fat, right? So you don't want to continuously sip hydrogen water all day long. Not only will it, it uh, remove the benefits, there is potential that it could worsen outcomes, right? When we look at, at the, the same dosing and other hormetic agents. Um, so you want to take it, I'd recommend once or twice a day, um, at most three times a day. And you want to take it on an empty stomach. So basically one of the patents I have in, involves um, the retention of H2 gas in, in various complex carbohydrates like, you know, oligosaccharides and polysaccharides. So what you're going to do if you're eating a big fiber meal already you're probably producing a bit of hydrogen gas so you want to like take that spike um 
two, those fibers are going to retain the hydrogen. So you're not getting the same spike. So you, you want to drink it either 15 minutes before you eat or maybe two to three hours after you eat, right? It's the best time to drink hydrogen water. And you also want to change your protocol probably every six months. You know, just like how if you do the exact same exercise every day for years, it stops being exercise. You stop putting on muscle, right? And you start getting slowly less and less fit. Um, I'm just proactively assuming hydrogen might be the same thing. So every six months, I'll wash out for a week and then change my protocol. Maybe I'll, I'll have all my hydrogen water first thing in the morning. And then the next rotation, I'll do half of it in the morning and then half right before my workout, right? So I change it up. Now, how much you need is also going to be really dependent on what level of stress and damage you have. Um, for instance, like I, I take like five tablets a day, right? You know, anywhere from four to six tablets a day. I, I, I get a super high dose, but I exercise a lot. I work a lot and I have a lot of chronic stress from my arthritis everywhere. Someone who say in their teens or twenties, who is a biohacker and super healthy, you might only need a tablet a few times a week when you have abnormal stress. Maybe you got a bad night's sleep. Maybe your workout was harder than you thought it was going to be, right? Or it was your big train of the week. Maybe you're traveling, right? So you change time zones and you, you, you flew and were exposed to radiation. So a person like that isn't going to need it every day and they're going to need a lower dose when they do it. Um, a person who say overweight and super unhealthy, you, you, again, you might need a higher dose, like more might be better, right? We tend to use two or three tablets a day in our clinical research, but there's no indication that more isn't going to work better, right? It, it very well could. Mm -hmm. I know that if I only take two or three tablets a day, I have significantly more pain and muscle soreness than if I scale it up to five or six. So I'd recommend think about your lifestyle, be honest with yourself, how much stress do you have, and then start at a reasonable starting point and titrate up until you don't see any more benefits. So if like you're taking four a day and you take five and it isn't a big boost, right? Then keep it at four. There's no point in doing extra if you're not feeling extra benefits. Right. But some people going from two to three makes a world of a difference. As for what you can mix it with, um, it goes great with other forms of hormesis. Right. Um, we know that from the research. And uh, we're actually doing a lot of research right now on, on synergy with active pharmaceutical agents. So we've published a lot of preclinical trials in, in rodents. Uh, again, talk to your doctor about this, right? I, I'm not getting any medical advice if this is just mice. We have a long way to go to see if this is going to work in humans, but we've seen synergy on, uh, you know, things like using hydrogen with sulfasalazine for ulcerative colitis. We've seen it on using the hydrogen tablets with, with uh, fluorosol 5-FU that's chemotherapeutic for colorectal cancer. Um, we have research coming out on uh, using hydrogen with the statin. We're just starting to analyze the results right now, but you know that that's, could be promising. Um, in other, you know, forms of uh, hydrogen, like uh, other research that's been done, not by us, but um, we've seen hydrogen with synergy with like uh, photobiomodulation, so like red light therapy, right? So there's a lot of uh, cool things that we can see, and we've heard anecdotally from a lot of customers that you know, various levels of their, their, you know, vitamins or minerals go up when they start taking hydrogen water. Yeah. I personally noticed that my nootropics that I use, brain supplements, they seem to work a bit stronger and they have a longer lasting effect and they're, they feel a bit smoother when I combine them with molecular hydrogen. So that's one that I personally noticed. I've also heard another researcher named Tyler Liberon mention that there's possible benefit to taking it multiple days in advance ahead of a stressor, such as like two or three days before you're flying to like help saturate the tissues rather than taking it the day of or like immediately as you're about to fly. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you definitely would want to load. If, if you're going to have an extreme stress, um, you know, a workout competition, right? Like a long haul flight, you know, if you're just flying for an hour, it's probably not that big of a stress on you. Um, 
you have a, like a longer flight, um, going in for surgery or something like that. I, I will always, before something like that, speed up where my washout period is and not take hydrogen like two weeks before and then titrate up for like a week, you know, to just super load my system with H2 before I do that. So, well, we will start to wrap this one up, Alex. I have a couple more questions for you and a mini rapid fire round. But before we go there, if people want to connect with you, to follow your work, to try some of your products, how do they go about that? My work is at alexternava.com or I have a research account, like ResearchGate account, which is just my name, Alex Ternava. Um, I can give you the links for that. I do publish my research on Instagram as well. Um, but my Instagram is uh, mostly like meals and you know when I'm at UFC fights and stuff like that. Uh, so less research and more just personal. Um, the products I know, uh, um, I think you, you have a discount code that you got from the Drake HRW brand. So that's a brand that, uh, I actually founded that brand. I, I've mostly sold it though. My, my focus is all on licensing my technology around the world and, you know, supporting the research and, you know, helping structure research and, uh, all the regulatory stuff like that. But I still have veto rights on all their products, so they can't launch a product without my sign off. So I do believe in, in everything that they're selling right now. And I, I think I take every single product that they sell currently. So yeah, they gave me the code urban. So if you guys use that, that will save you 15% on, I believe your first order. All right, Alex, if there was a worldwide burning of the books and all knowledge on earth was lost, you get to save the works of three teachers. What do you save and why? So I think if something like that happens, the most important thing, and I actually think this is the most important thing anyways, um, isn't uh, related to specific pieces of knowledge. It's related to how to think, right? Because if we know how to think, then we can make progress and get back to where we've come from. Um, I, I would say Nietzsche for sure. Um, I think if something happened like that, uh, it's going to be a very stressful period of time. Um, there, there's, there's going to be a lot of trauma, a lot of, uh, anxiety, um, which leads to a lot of bad decisions. So I'll use someone from modern days just because he, he summarizes the entire basis of, of a field, but I'd say Ryan Halliday to teach what the Stoics taught us, right? So that we can keep even emotions and move forward, you know, into the future. Maybe uh, to interject art and the understanding in humanity, I, I'd say Dostoevsky, because I don't think there's been a better writer in understanding the human condition and creating amazing pieces of, of you know, fictional art, but that, that have uh, deep connections to psychology and quite the scholar. Well, Alex, we'll do a quick rapid fire round now and then call it a day. Are there any big myths around molecular hydrogen that need to be dispelled? Yeah, well, it, 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 uh, it doesn't improve hydration, right? Um, so hydrogen water isn't better at hydrating. Um, it doesn't alkalize your body right? Hydrogen has nothing to do with pH of water, right? And in fact, if it was hydrogen ions in the water, like a lot of people falsely claim, that would actually be acid water, not alkaline water. So it's not like the hydrogen is neutral, right? It doesn't affect the pH, doesn't affect your hydration. Is there anything in particular that you are interested in or researching these days outside of hydrogen? I am uh, designing, um, you know, a patent pending inhalation device right now actually with uh dr lebaron we've been working on it for a number of years uh, right now the inhalation devices on the market are either safe and ineffective or effective but potentially explosive so we've been working through the engineering challenges on making a device that's safe and effective. At the very beginning of the episode you mentioned that you were combing through the research and you tried a bunch of different things and hydrogen is the one that you ended up obviously focusing on, but were there any other molecules or therapies that 
either looked very promising to you or that you personally used and noticed a difference from? So I was going to cryotherapy chambers, you know, several times a week. I just found that uh, it would make me feel better for a few hours and then all the inflammation would come back. So it definitely was having some acute benefits, but it wasn't lasting um, too long. I, I tried other things like high dose, like curcumin, it didn't seem to be working very well. I'd have to go back to my notes because we're going back a decade, but I, I know I, I bought all sorts of supplements. I uh, tried different like therapies that I got at, at different like uh, practitioners offices. One was like, uh, it, it had like a, a FDA cleared medical device and it had a little bit of clinical research and it was certain wavelengths that it was putting into my body and it didn't work at all. I can't remember what it was called. Then how would you like to wrap up our episode together today? Uh, I guess my best advice for people is um, just be honest with yourself about your level of stress, right? Um, think about how close you are to ideal. And the best way to try hydrogen therapy is, is to start at a reasonable starting point on dosage and realize that nothing is magic, right? Like all of the things that are going wrong with your health took years or decades to come together. Taking a single dosage of something is not going to cure all of your issues. It's going to be slow, steady improvements over weeks and months and years, right? To get back on track or reverse some of the damage that you have or slow it down, right? If you're at an advanced stage. So I'd say be honest and have reasonable expectations because we don't have the magic pill for anything. Well, Alex, it's been a pleasure chatting with you and diving into this fascinating world, hearing about your backstory and all the while keeping expectations realistic that hydrogen probably isn't going to be the magic bullet or at least the sole magic bullet in the arsenal of health optimization tools. I hope that this has been helpful for you. If you enjoyed it, subscribe and hit the thumbs up. I love knowing who's in the 1% committed to reaching their full potential. Comment 1% below so that I know who you are. For all the resources and links, meet me on my website at mindbodypeak.com. I appreciate you and look forward to connecting with you. As a reminder, information depicted in this video is for information purposes only. Please consult your primary healthcare professional before making any lifestyle changes.